<laughs> marriage, divorce, and remarriage is one of the most complicated subjects in the brotherhood. But it's only complicated to those who don't want to heed the basic teaching on this subject. If we would just understand and accept the fact that we were created by God, that marriage is an institution designed by God, that God has the right to tell us what two people can enter into a marriage, that is male and female, and how marriage can be dissolved. God is the author of marriage according to Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 24. However, Jesus said, therefore, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder or separate Matthew 19 and verse number six. Now, Jesus, in giving his commandment on this subject, he makes it really plain. He gives only one reason for divorce, and that is adultery. In Matthew 19, nine, Jesus said, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Jesus gives only one reason for dissolving a marriage, and that is adultery. In other words, men, if your wife goes out and have sexual relations with another man or another woman these days, Jesus gives you the license to put her away, to divorce her. Women, if your husband goes out and have sexual relations with another woman, or another man these days, Jesus gives you the license to put him away, to divorce him. Now, we know that God hates divorce. Malachi 2.16 tells us, For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garments with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed, pay attention to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. God hates divorce. He detests it. And if you're on the brink of divorce or your divorce was for unscriptural reasons, God would rather that you work things out, be willing to forgive each other and strengthen yourselves in the Lord. Nonetheless, if you can't work it out, Jesus did give only one exception to dissolve the marriage, and that's adultery. But what is adultery? How is adultery defined? Adultery is sexual intercourse of a man with a married woman other than his own spouse or sexual intercourse of a woman with a married man other than her own husband. It is having sexual relations with anyone other than one's husband or wife. It is illicit sexual relations with someone other than one's married partner. And did you know that you can commit adultery on your spouse and still be married to them? Because adultery in marriage is a sexual sin. Now, I need to address some things that many of our brethren, they don't dive too deep into in regards to this subject. Number one, God never designed divorce to be an easy way out. Well, someone says, what do you mean, Brother Bryant? Since God hates divorce, Malachi 2.16, he's not going to make it easy for the marriage to be dissolved. Okay, let's say that a woman has substantiated evidence that her husband has committed adultery on her. In other words, she has proof that her husband has gone outside of the marriage and had an affair on her. Now, allow me to add this. A gut feeling is not substantiated evidence. Your friend or family member seeing your husband talking to another woman, uh uh-uh, it's not substantiated evidence. Wait a minute, he came home late from work one day and oh, now you feel in your heart that he's cheating. No, that's not substantiated evidence. Substantiated evidence would be what we find in John chapter eight, around verse number four, where the scribes and Pharisees went to Jesus and said, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery. Listen to it. In the very act, it is a sexual sin. And if he's caught in the very act of sex, that's substantiated evidence. Or he's had a child with another woman while you two are still married and the DNA confirms that he's the father, that's substantiated evidence. Or he has admitted to you openly that he had an affair on you while you two are still married. 
These, and I'm sure there are more, would serve as proof, as evidence of his infidelity. Divorce is not an easy way out of marriage. You have to have proof. You have to have evidence and not just some gut feeling. In addition, if your spouse kisses another person in a passionate way, that's not considered adultery. It's sinful. And the Bible commands that passion for someone other than your spouse should be put to death. Colossians chapter three, verse number five. However, it is not grounds for adultery. It can lead to adultery, but it's not adultery. If your spouse is watching porn or lusting for what he sees on the screen, it's sinful. Matthew chapter five, verse 28. But it's not grounds for divorce. It can lead to the physical act of adultery, but it's not grounds for divorce. Again, adultery is sexual intercourse. That is having physical sexual contact with someone other than your spouse. Now, please take heed to this because this is very important. You know, millions of people mess their lives up early on when they are young and some older people not understanding that marriage is a lifetime commitment, that marriage is an institution designed by God and it must be taken seriously. Let's say that a woman has evidence that her husband has committed adultery on her. I mean, she has proof and not just some accusations. So she has purpose in her mind to put her husband away, to divorce him. Now, listen, if she goes out and have sex with another man before her divorce is finalized and a divorce on an average can take between three to 24 months, depending on whether it is contested or uncontested. Nonetheless, women, listen, if you have evidence that your husband committed adultery on you and you plan to put him away to divorce him, and during the three to 24 month time period, before your divorce is finalized, you go out and have sexual relations with another man while your divorce is processing. You have also committed adultery and would not be free to divorce your husband. Now, you may ask why? Because you did the exact same thing he did. You cheated in the marriage, your divorce was not finalized and you could not lawfully put him away for adultery. But then you would say, he did it first. Wait a minute, you did it second. Your divorce would not be approved. It would not be honored by God because you also cheated. You committed adultery in the marriage. And this applies to the men too. If you go out and have sexual relations before your divorce is finalized, then you could not divorce your wife for committing adultery on you when you did the exact same thing she did by committing adultery in the marriage. But I know there are some who are hearing this who will say, you know what, I completely disagree. And I understand. So allow me to give you another example that a marriage must be completed for it to be honored by God, just like a divorce is to be completed, finalized in order for it to be honored by God today. A man and woman decides to be married, let's say in September. The wedding is prepared, it's done. The day is here and she's walking down the aisle. But before her soon to be husband can say, I do, he drops dead. Or before he says, I do, she has a change of mind and leaves him at the altar. Question. Are they married? Is the wedding finalized? Of course not. And why aren't they married? Because the marriage was not completed and therefore God would not recognize them as ever being married. There's a famous actress by the name of Aubrey Hepburn who was to marry a man named James Hansen in the early 1950s. She called meeting him love at first sight. But after having her wedding dress fitted, the date was set. She decided that the marriage would not work because the demands of both of their careers. So they never married, although they were scheduled to be married. She changed her mind and God never recognized them as ever being married. The same applies to divorce. Now think about it. If you have purpose in your mind to divorce your spouse, and before the divorce is finalized, 
you have a change of mind and forgive them. You don't have to go get married again because you are still married and would only have to dismiss the divorce proceedings. You know, before my wife and I became Christians, we were married when we were in the world. Now, God recognized our marriage when we were in the world. And once we became Christians, my wife and I did not have to get married again. The church accepted our marriage because they understood that God recognized our marriage. So since God recognized our marriage when we were in the world, I want you to think about this now. Why would he not recognize adultery, unscriptural marriages, and unscriptural divorces in the world? So if a woman is married and she is in the process of getting a divorce and she goes out and have sexual relations with a man before her divorce is finalized, she has committed adultery just like her husband has in the sight of God because they are still married and her divorce will not be recognized by God. You know, another thing I'd like for us to discuss is that God does not recognize all marriages as being lawful. Just because you are married does not mean that God recognized your marriage as being lawful. For instance, in Mark chapter 6, verse 17, the Bible tells us, for Herod himself has sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Listen to it now. For he had married her. Because John has said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. John had told Herod that it is not lawful. It is not authorized by God for you to have your brother Philip's wife, although he married her. You see, the government in which Herod lived, it recognized Herod as being married to Herodias. But God did not recognize it as being lawful. Listen, you may be married to someone, and if you divorce your spouse for any reason except the one reason Jesus gave in Matthew 19, 9, and you married again, you are currently living in adultery. And although the state has recognized your marriage, God has not recognized it as being lawful. Therefore, God does not recognize all marriages as being lawful. And allow me to add this while we're passing through here. Baptism does not wash away an adulterous marriage because some people believe that once you are baptized, then baptism will wash away an adulterous marriage and you can remain in that union. Now, let me explain to you why this can't be true. Before John was put in prison, he was baptizing people in the River Jordan as they were coming to him confessing their sins. Mark chapter three, verses one through four. If baptism washed away adulterous marriages or unlawful marriages, the only thing John had to do was tell Herod and Herodias to meet him at the Jordan River so he can baptize them. And then their marriage, which was not lawful and unlawful in the sight of God, would all of a sudden be lawful in the sight of God. And they could remain in that marriage. And you see, John didn't do that. John told Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. And he lost his head for it and for rebuking Herod for all the other evils which Herod had done. Luke chapter 3 and verse 19 tells us. Baptism does not wash away adulterous marriages. Also, Jesus' disciples were baptized during the same time John was baptizing. Remember Herod wanted to kill Jesus, Luke 13 verse 31? And it's quite obvious that Jesus knew what was in man, for he knew all men, John 2 and verse 25. Therefore, Jesus knew that Herod was in adultery in an unlawful marriage with Herodias. If baptism washed away adulterous marriage, listen to this now, the only thing Jesus had to do was to offer baptism to Herod and Herodias, and then that which was was unlawful would have become lawful in the sight of God. Jesus didn't do that. Again, baptism does not wash away unlawful marriages so that you can remain in the sin. Also, divorce is not an easy way out of marriage. It's a whole lot harder to get a divorce according to the Bible than many people think. Another error that makes it harder to get a divorce is that you can be the cause, a contributor of your wife's infidelity. Men. Did you know that you can cause your wife 
to fall into the arms of another man. Someone may say, how, Brother Bryant? Matthew 5, verses 31 and 32. Jesus makes this quite clear. Jesus would say, furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Verse 32. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality, here it is, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. According to Jesus, not me, not you, not your preacher, not your mama, not your daddy, the government or anyone else. Jesus said, if you divorce your spouse for any reason except sexual immorality, you cause her to commit adultery and you will be guilty of contributing to her infidelity. You can't put your wife away for any reason except what Jesus said, which would be sexual immorality or adultery. Now, do we see how hard it is, according to the Bible, to get a divorce? You know, there's a second reason that makes it hard to get a divorce. And many men are affected by this reason than women are. But I've heard a few cases where the woman is affected by this just like the husband is. But let's deal with the man being affected by this reason. The wife is always saying no to sex. Every time a husband asks for sex, she's always saying no, no, no. And this is all the time. And there's nothing wrong with her physically, nothing wrong with her mentally, emotionally, nor psychologically. Listen, women, you may not like to hear this, but this is a clear violation of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. Notice what the Bible tells us here. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her. And likewise, also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Verse five, do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Verse five specifically commands that the husband and wife are not to deprive one another. That word deprive, that means to call someone not to possess something. And since the context is referring to the wife and husband's bodies in marriage, we are not to deprive one another sexually. Now, I'm not talking about if your wife is sick or the manner of woman is with her, or she has surgery and so on. I'm talking about when the wife or the husband deliberately deprive each other sexually all the time for no good reason, and it's not consensual. I mean, depriving each other for months and months at a time, and I've heard in some cases, years at a time, scripturally, you can't do this. And why? Because Satan would tempt you because of your lack of self Control. And how does Satan tempt you? Because of your lack of self control. You start watching porn magazines. You start watching porn on the internet, going to strip clubs. Old girlfriend and old boyfriend start to come around and you show interest. Baby mamas, baby daddies, co workers, desperate secretaries, sisters in the church, preachers, elders, and deacons who pray on weak and vulnerable sisters. I can go on and on and on with this. And when you start looking other places to gratify your sexual appetite, I can assure you, the more you look, the more you will find what you're looking for in the arms of another person. Now, you tell me if I'm lying. See, you know I'm not lying, and I know I'm not lying, because it happens in the world, and unfortunately, it happens in the church. You're probably experiencing something like that right now, or you know someone who is. So to the wives and to the husbands, we cannot deprive one another sexually. And ask yourself this question honestly. Can you divorce your spouse for committing adultery on you when you deliberately deprive them of their scriptural rights to your body? 
Do you really believe that God will honor your divorce if you willfully withheld sex from your spouse and in some cases withheld sex so you can be with another man and the men will want to be with another woman? But when your husband gets weak because he can't maintain self-control and he goes out and cheat, you cry adultery when you have contributed to his sin. Now you want a divorce. I tell you that God will not honor that type of deception. What does Romans chapter 12, verse 9 tell us? Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Now, do we see, can we understand that you can be a contributor of your spouse in fidelity? When my wife and I were pregnant with our twin boys, I had to wait. I had to have some self-control during the last trimester of my wife's pregnancy. And until she bounced back, until she recovered after pregnancy, I couldn't say, since my wife is preoccupied with this pregnancy here, I'm going to go out and sow my royal oaks and have sex with as many women as I possibly can. Uh Uh-uh. I had to have self-control during that time. And it was some six to eight weeks, and it could be longer in some cases. Nonetheless, I had to exercise self-control. Control And men, you have to exercise self-control. So if our wives are sick, we have to exercise self-control. If she's tired from a long day at work, whether she works in the field, that is, if she have an outside job out of the home, or she is a stay-at-home mom, if she's not in the mood, men, we have to exercise self-control. Find something else to do until your wife recovers from being so tired. Go fishing. Play golf, cut the grass, wash the car, do something until she recovers from being so tired. And allow me to add this. I want you to think about this now. Can I cheat on my wife and not tell her what I did and it be pleasing to God? Can you cheat on your wife or women? Can you cheat on your husband and not tell him and it be pleasing to God? Surely you can't. First Corinthians chapter seven, verse four, remember? The Bible tells us the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. My body sexually belongs to my wife and her body sexually belongs to me. Can a man take his body and give it to another woman when his body sexually, according to the Bible, is the authority of his wife? No, he can't do that. Can a woman take her body and give it to another man when her body sexually, according to the Bible, is the authority of her husband? No, absolutely not. Therefore, you can't cheat. You can't commit adultery and not tell. Your body does not belong to you sexually. It belongs to your spouse, the one you became one with in marriage. Genesis 2.24, Matthew 19.5, Ephesians 6.31. So when you cheat and you don't tell, you have built up a lie in your marriage. That is not good. God is not pleased. And that which you have done will displease the Lord. Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 27. Now I tell you, the many who may disagree with this are probably the ones that have gone out and cheated and don't want to tell. Listen, you have to suffer the consequences of your actions. Someone has said, oh, why should I tell? Because God did not tell you, men, to go out and cheat on your wife. And women, God did not tell you to go out and commit adultery on your husband. Now do we see how hard it is to dissolve a marriage according to the Bible? Then here's another thought of most people. Broadly thought, broadly people. What she don't know won't hurt. What he don't know won't hurt. That's the world talking. God knows, right? Hebrews 4.13, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Psalms 90 verse 8, you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. Jeremiah 16, 17, God said, for my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from my face, nor is their iniquity hidden from my eyes. In Numbers chapter 32 and verse 23, oh my, my, my. The Bible tells us, and be sure your sin will find you out. Your sin will, not might, but it will. That's what the Bible says, find you out. 
I've seen many times when brethren sin found them out in the church. Listen, don't you think your sin won't find you out? Remember Joseph in Genesis chapter 39, verse 7? His master's wife cast long in eyes at him, and she said, lie with me. And what does the Bible tell us Joseph did? Genesis 39, verse 89, the Bible tells us. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in his house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you. Why? Because you are his wife. Then Joseph said, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? What was that great wickedness? To have sex with another man's wife. Joseph said, having sex with another man's wife is a great wickedness against God. Not only would you be sinning against God, but you would be violating your marriage vows and your wife or your husband, women, have a right to know. James 5, 16, confess your trespass to one another and pray for another that you may be healed. And this healing here is referring to you being healed from your sin. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. You need more? 1 John 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You have to tell your spouse and suffer the consequences of your actions. Again, God didn't tell you to commit adultery on your wife, men. And women, God didn't tell you to go out and cheat on your husband. And God is faithful that he will forgive us of our sins, but we have to do the right thing. And think about this. Suppose you contracted an STD. You don't feel that your wife has a right to know before you lay down and have sexual relations with her again. And if the shoe was on the other foot and you were the faithful one in the marriage and your wife went out and contracted a sexually transmitted disease from another man, would you want to know? Would you want to know? Surely you would. And allow me to add this, men. If your wife decides to forgive you for committing adultery on her, and she needs time to heal from the hurt that you caused her. Don't you wonder 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4 and 5, talking about, oh, she's depriving me. No, you can't use that. You best to exercise some self-control during that time because she has every right to heal from the hurt that you caused just as if she was healing from a surgery or having a child. You best to exercise self-control. So in closing, what did we learn? That marriage is an institution designed by God from the beginning. Genesis 2, 24. That Jesus only gives us one reason for divorce, and that is adultery. Matthew 19, 9. That God hates divorce, Malachi 2 and verse 16. That God never designed divorce to be an easy way out. And you can be a contributor of your spouse infidelity. If you fall in any of these categories and you've married again unscripturally or you're cheating on your wife or your husband right now and you are married, you are currently in adultery and would need to sever that relationship. Someone has said, but God will forgive me, wouldn't he? God is a forgiving God, isn't he, Brother Melvin? He will forgive me of my sins of adultery, wouldn't he? Sure he would. There is not a sin that God would not forgive you for if you repent. However, you can't continue in sin that grace may abound. God forbids, Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. How shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? In other words, you can't remain in adultery. Ask God to forgive you of adultery and then return back to it. Because every time you are having sex with someone that you are not authorized to be with, you are committing adultery, you will have to sever the adulterous relationship if you want to be pleasing to God. And if by chance you can't get back with your first spouse after an unscriptural divorce, you will have to live your life as a eunuch for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Matthew chapter 19, verse number 12. That's what Jesus would say. 
Listen, I know it's hard, but if you want to go to heaven, if you want to see the face of God, you'll be honest with yourself. Repent of the sin of adultery and then do works befitting repentance. I want to add a few more things and then I'll close. First, there is a misunderstanding regarding Romans chapter 7 verses 1 through 4. Many people are confused and believe that these scriptures give a license for an adulterous marriage. Let's look at it. Romans chapter 7 verses 1 through 4. The Bible tells us, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. Now, remember, the husband is the head of his wife, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 3. As long as he lives, she is to be under his rule and not another man's rule, but under his rule, her husband's rule, as long as he lives. Verse 3. So then if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. So if her husband is living and she divorces him for unscriptural reasons or he divorces her for unscriptural reasons and she marries again, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, this is referring to her still being married to him under his rule when he dies. She is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, although she has married another man. She married another man after her husband died. This text is not teaching that you can divorce your spouse unscripturally and then willfully enter into adultery. And then when your first spouse dies, your first spouse died. Your adulterous marriage becomes holy in the sight of God. This is not how God designed marriage. Notice verse four. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. The main point of the text is that the children of Israel had become dead to the law of Moses through the body of Christ. So they could not be married to the law of Moses and to the law of Christ at the same time. They could not be married to both laws. So they died. The Mosaic law died and freed the children of Israel to marry the law of Christ. Now, allow me to give you some scriptural references that show the death of a spouse frees the living spouse to marry again. Abraham did not marry Keturah until Sarah was dead. Genesis chapter 25 and verse number one. Abraham and Sarah were still married. When Sarah died, it freed Abraham to marry Keturah. David didn't marry Abigail until Nabal was dead. First Samuel chapter 25 and verse number 40. Abigail and Nabal were still married. And when Nabal died, it freed Abigail to marry again. David didn't marry Bathsheba until Uriah the Hittite was dead. 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 27. Again, Uriah the Hittite and Bathsheba were still married when Uriah died. And then it freed Bathsheba to marry again. Boaz took Ruth to be his wife because her husband Malon was dead. Ruth chapter 4 and verse 13. Ruth and Malon were still married. And when he died, it freed Ruth to marry Boaz. In every case, God allowed the person to marry again once their spouse was dead. There is no scripture allowance for a person to divorce their spouse for any reason. Willfully put yourself in adultery. Play the waiting game until your first spouse dies. And then your marriage that is unholy all of a sudden becomes holy in the sight of God. Listen, God did not design marriage that way. There is no such doctrine in the Bible that teaches that way. In Matthew chapter 22 and verse 23 beginning, we find a woman who was married seven times. However, each time her husband died, she was free to marry again. She did not marry the first husband and then divorced him unscripturally, enter into a second marriage, then wait till her first husband died and said, oh, now my marriage to my second husband is lawful because my first husband is dead. That is not the teachings of the Bible. My wife and I will not be married in heaven. 
Jesus said that in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Nonetheless, the thrust of the argument is this. You can't be married to another person until your spouse who you are currently living with is dead. The woman who was married to the first brother did not marry again until the one she was married to had died. Matthew 22, verse 23 and following. Today, you can't be married to a person, divorce them for unscriptural reasons, enter into adultery by marrying someone else, and then once your first spouse has died, then all of a sudden, your adulterous, unlawful marriage becomes lawful in the sight of God. That is not how God designed marriage. And have you ever thought about this? Suppose you died first while living adultery then you've condemned yourself to an eternal hell. Again, God never designed nor purpose for divorce to be an easy way out of marriage. Here's another important factor regarding divorce I'd like for us to explore. If you are innocent and you have the right to divorce your spouse, you not being guilty of any of the aforementioned, you can have in your mind all day long that you're going to put your spouse away. But until the divorce papers are signed, until they are filed and completed, you are still married. And allow me to add this. If your spouse divorces you for committing adultery, and if they died after having put you away for adultery, that does not free you to marry again. Because you are no longer married to them. You being the guilty spouse can never marry again according to what Jesus said. Also, if they married again after having scripturally put you away for adultery, their living spouse has a right to marry again. Not you. You're not the living spouse. Another thing I would like for us to address is that 1 Corinthians chapter 7 Verses 17 through 24 is not teaching that one can remain in a sinful calling, which you were called. Listen, just one chapter up, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, Paul had just mentioned sins such as fornication, idolater, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, nor extortioners, Paul said, will inherit the kingdom of God. Then he said in verse 11, and such were past tense. Some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. Surely that does not sound like Paul was promoting the idea of continuing in a sin or the calling which you were called. But what some are advocating is if you're called as a thief, you have to stop stealing before you become a Christian. You need to repent of that sin. Listen, that's true. Some are even saying, look, let's say one was called as a homosexual, then they will have to stop. They will have to repent from being a homosexual before they come to Christ. Listen, that's true. But if you are called to Christ while in adultery, this is what some are teaching. You can repent that one time and then return back to adultery. That's not what the Bible is teaching, because what they are failing to realize is that adultery is a sexual sin. Each time you lay down and have sexual relations with someone other than your spouse, the one that God joined you to in marriage, you are committing adultery. Paul is not teaching for one to remain in the same calling or the same sin which he was called. Now, do we see how ignorant that sounds? Paul is not promoting the idea for anyone to remain in sin after they have become a Christian. In addition, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 through 16 is not giving the deserted Christian license to marry again if the unbelieving spouse departs. Even in this case, brethren, if the unbeliever departs or separates, your divorce has to be for what Jesus said, which is adultery and not for, I want you to listen to this now, an abusive spouse? Uh-uh. Not for an alcoholic spouse? Nope not for an unsupportive spouse or any other reason, except adultery is what Jesus said in Matthew 19, 9. And if there is an abusive spouse or an alcoholic spouse, you can separate from the abuse with the hopes that the abuser would get the proper help. But that's not a reason 
for a divorce. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 through 16 is not promoting the idea for a Christian to willfully marry an unbeliever. And then when you can't convert them, you run to these verses and say, hey, my unbelieving spouse has departed. Now I'm free to marry again. Uh-uh. Nope. You can't do that. Your divorce must be for adultery and no other reason. This is why the Lord's disciples said, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. Matthew 19, verse 10. God did not design marriage to be an easy way out. Since he hates divorce, Malachi 2.16, he would not make marriage an easy avenue out. Finally, if you are an innocent spouse, when you go file your paperwork, because you are the one that have the right to file for divorce, the guilty spouse does not have a right to file because they are guilty of adultery and can never marry again. So when you go file your paperwork, please be sure to make sure your paperwork says adultery. Because Jesus did not say in Matthew 19, 9, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for irreconcilable differences and marries another commits adultery. That's not what Jesus said. Because irreconcilable differences mean there was a no-fault grounds for divorce. In other words, no one was guilty. If your spouse committed adultery on you, your divorce papers need to reflect that and say adultery. It is my sincere prayer that I present this lesson as plain as I possibly can and that you would heed the things that God will have you to do change your life. If you're in adultery, come out of it and do what's right before it's too late. If you're cheating on your wife, man, you need to sever that relationship and come out of it. Women, if you are cheating on your husband, you need to stop that sin. Stop committing adultery. Come out of it. And then you must, both of you, you must tell the other what you have done if you want to be pleasing to God. And as I close, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 16, have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth. That was a question that was posed regarding sex outside of marriage. There was this young couple slated to be married on a particular day. And the bridesmaids had a bachelorette party for the bride. The groomsmen had a bachelor party for the groom. 
Now, during the bridesmaids' bachelorette party, they hired a male dancer to entertain them for that evening. Now, during his entertaining them, they enticed the bride to engage in sexual relations with the male dancer because they told her, this is your last night as a free woman. Listen, this is a true story. So she went in and engaged in sexual relations with the male dancer before she was married to her husband. And guess what the bridesmaids did? They actually had it filmed. Now, you see, this is the type of world that we live in, perverted. The next day, they went down the aisle as if nothing happened. She went down the aisle and met her husband-to-be and said, I do. Now they are married. One week later, one week later, the husband found out what she did, and they gave him a copy of the video. What type of friends were these? And once he saw that video, oh, he was mad. He was angry. And he went to his wife and said, I am going to put you away for a, a, a cheating on me. You were wrong for what you did. Yes, she was wrong. But my question is, on what grounds can he divorce her? Listen, I know it sounds tough, but let's do this from a biblical perspective. What grounds do we have to put her away? None. You say, now, wait a minute, Melvin. What do you mean? Listen, she committed a sexual act outside of the marriage. They were never married when she committed this sexual act. It would be called fornication. Fornication can be defined as Two people engaging in sexual relations without being married. That is a definition of fornication. Adultery is when a married man or a married woman engages in sexual relations with someone other than his or her own spouse. Listen, they were not married when she engaged in this sexual relation. She fornicated on her boyfriend, her fiance, but she did not commit adultery on her husband. Was it wrong? Yes, it was wrong. It was wrong. It was a sin. First Corinthians chapter six, verses nine and 10. It was wrong for what she did, but he has no grounds to put her away because she did not commit the sexual act in the marriage. See, I know it sounds hard. I know it's tough, but you have a lot of people in the world who are confused about what I just told you. The woman has sex on her boyfriend or on her fiance, not her husband. And therefore, she has the right to stay in the marriage. He does not have a right to put her away for adultery because adultery was not committed. There was another question that was posed to me. And I got a call one day and the young man said, look, um, I put my wife away for adultery. And I said, what did she do? What evidence, what proof do you have? He said, my wife was in a restaurant and she allowed a man to rub her shoulders. And by the man rubbing her shoulders, and when I saw it, that is adultery, and I put her away. I had to tell the young man, listen, biblically, that's not adultery. Now, I'm not saying it's right for her to allow a man to rub her shoulders and massage her in a, in a sexual way. Well, well, that's wrong. But that's not adultery. So I had to tell the young man, you cannot put your wife 
a way for allowing someone to rub her shoulders in a passionate way. Now, I'm not saying it's right. It's wrong. And that type of activity should not be engaged with with two people that's supposed to be married. But he can't divorce her for that. He can be angry and upset and try to get some help or therapy for the two in the marriage. But they can't divorce because a man rubbed his wife's shoulders. That's not adultery. And I'm telling you all this because people are confused about what adultery is. Adultery is a sexual, physical act. Engaging in sex with someone other than your spouse. That's what adultery is. Shaking hands, rubbing hands, rubbing shoulders, rubbing arms is not considered adultery. I pray that this help you understand what God considers adultery and what is not. The first time Jesus came to church, they mocked him, didn't they? The first time he came, they spat upon him. The first time he came, they slapped him. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They divided his garments. They cast lots and, and they crucified our Lord. That happened the first time. When he comes the second time, church, the Bible says he's going to come to his glory, Matthew 25, verse 31. He's coming with all, not some, but all the holy angels the, the second time. He's going to sit on his throne the second time. When we see him, we're going to see him in his true power the second time. There will be no mocking the second time, church. Oh, no. The second time, you won't be able to mock the Lord. There will be no spitting on the Lord the second time, not the second time, because he accomplished that and allowed you to do it the first time. The second time he come back, you will not spit on our Lord. The second time when he comes back, you will not be putting a crown of thorns on our Lord's head because he allowed you to do it the first time. The second time, that's not going to happen. Those days are past. When he comes back again, there will be no cross carrying on our Lord. That's not going to happen. He's not going to come back the second time to carry the cross and the burdens of the world. That's not going to happen, church. The second time he comes back, he's not going to die for humanity. You can forget it. When he comes back the second time, it's going to be a whole different arena. When the Lord comes back the second time, the first time Jesus came, the Bible tells us in John 3, 16, y'all remember? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See, the second time, he don't have to give his son because his son accomplished what he's supposed to did the first time. So God gave his only begotten son the first time that whoever believes in him, John 3, 16, should not perish but have everlasting life. The second time Jesus comes back, you know what's going to happen? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8 through 10 tells us, in flame and fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know the Lord. He's coming back with vengeance on those who do not obey the gospel church. And if you didn't believe before you died or you don't believe now, it's going to be too late when church the second time. You see, the second time when the Lord's return, when he returned, there will not be no miraculous birth. Mary ain't going to have another child. There ain't going to be another, another virgin that's going to have Jesus again. That's not going to happen. There's not going to be no shedding of our Lord's blood the second time. You can forget that. The best thing that we need to do is make sure that we are prepared the second time because the world was not prepared the first time. And the world surely is not prepared this time either.